Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless the bible indicates that there will be a great apostasy during the end times as we read in second thessalonians 2 3 let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition falling away is the greek word apostasia which means defection from the truth properly the state apostasy apostasia from which we get the english word apostasy refers to a general defection from the true god the bible and the christian faith jesus warned the disciples concerning the final days as we read in matthew 24 10 through 12 and then many will be offended will betray one another and will hate one another then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many and because lawlessness will abound the love of many will grow cold. These are the characteristics of the great apostasy of the end times. By looking at the news headlines of our world today, there can be no doubt we are living in the final moments before Jesus' return. Do you have to have faith? Our series, The State of Spirituality, asks the question, State of Spirituality with Lisa Lang. There she is, there's Lisa. We've been taking uh, looks at different paths to faith. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this morning we bring you a story about an often overlooked but key part of this conversation. Non-believers. Lisa Ling visits a group hoping to offer a sense of community that's often found in churches and mosques and temples, but for people who don't want to get God involved. You can count on me. At first impression, like one, two, three, this may look like a typical contemporary Sunday morning church service. The difference is the one I'm attending has music, it has a message, it has fellowship. It just doesn't have God. Psalm 14.1 The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. This is a non-religious gathering in Los Angeles called Sunday Assembly. What does Sunday Assembly mean to you? It means community. Sunday Assembly is family for me. I would always have conversations with other friends who are atheists is we never had community and when I discovered Sunday Assembly I found that community. Ryan Trout, Amy Boyle and Sam Renderos are all leaders within Sunday Assembly's LA chapter. Most here are not affiliated with an organized religion and they're not alone. Nearly 30 percent of U.S. adults are now religiously unaffiliated often defining themselves as atheist, no belief in God, or agnostic, unsure if there's a God. I reject most supernatural, if not all, supernatural ideas. I have need for community and human connection, the, the stuff that to me matters most. Rendero says that connection is being formed here at Sunday Assembly. It may be an unconventional gathering, but it employs a very conventional structure. Having this curiosity and asking your own questions. We have a, a TED Talk style talk. We do uh, sing-alongs, tell a personal story. This might be sounding familiar because it has a lot of the same components that a church might, but we don't do religion. Colossians 2.8 Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Founded in 2013 by two comedians in the UK, Sunday Assembly was created for those seeking a secular community. It now has around 60 chapters all over the world, including in other US cities like Atlanta, Chapel Hill, and Nashville. We release a lot of endorphins singing together. It helps unite people. Like the, the ingredients of a church service are Powerful. Speaking of interesting topics, it's time for our speaker to come and join the stage. But the members acknowledge their church-like structure may not be for everyone. 
especially since one in three U.S. adults report suffering from some sort of religious trauma. Are there some people for whom that kind of structure might be a turnoff and actually Absolutely. triggering? Yeah, Absolutely. religion has harmed a lot of people. We have people that find it triggering, the, the actual assembly that happens once a month, but still comes to our game nights and comes to our book clubs, comes to our volunteer events, and they're no less a member of the community than the people that come every month to the Sunday assembly. And what's wonderful about this <laughs> is nobody's going to anywhere back <laughs> if they don't come. So there's no, there's no hard sell. Despite most members being atheists, all are welcome here. Yes, even those with faith, which includes Trout. So Ryan, you are not atheist. You are more agnostic. I like to say I'm an agnostic Episcopalian. <laughs> Raised Baptist in Kentucky, Trout left the religion. He says because of its exclusion of women and the queer community. I like the organized part of it. I know a lot of people read from organized religion, but the organized part of it was <laughs> such a sell point for me. He began identifying as agnostic, but at the same time was also called to the ancient rituals found in the Episcopal Church. Now he's trying to bring similar rituals to Sunday assembly. The Apostle John tells us these false converts claim to be believers, but were not, as stated in 1 John 2.19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. When John said, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us, shows proof that these false converts who abandoned their faith were not true believers. This is in sharp contrast with those who are saved, know the truth, and have been anointed, as we read in 1 John 2, 20 and 21. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. These false converts did not have God's Spirit within them. They did not know the truth. We're working on a book of like secular traditions and rituals that we can pass on to people because I think it's important, it's historic, it, it, you feel part of something bigger than yourself. What does my life mean? What matters to me? Why does it matter to me? Those are questions we all ask whether we're religious or not. Those are spiritual questions. I first learned about Sunday Assembly from Varun Soni, the Dean of Religious Life at the University of Southern California. He says spirituality helps give people meaning, but that meaning can also be found in secular spaces. So for those who claim to be atheists, but um, take part in rituals, yeah. collective rituals. Yeah. How would you explain that? Atheists and humanists in the United States are the most religiously literate people, actually, if you look at all the data. They've done their research, and just because you don't believe in God doesn't mean you don't believe in something. And so the atheists, humanists, agnostics I know, many of them have deeply spiritual lives, and in fact, they're animated by the idea that as humans, we can do great work in the world. That very idea is part of the Sunday Assembly motto. Live better! Help often and wonder more. And they say they don't need religion to tell them to do or be good. Romans 3, 10 through 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. When it comes down to where does morality come from, it, it comes from like yeah. this, it comes from ourselves and our connections to each other. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, come on. Baby, don't you wanna go? For those here, it's not about heaven or hell. It's about being part of a community that supports one another, not in the afterlife, but in this one. What did Jesus say or teach about hell? Hell is a fiery furnace. Matthew 13, 41 through 42. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place of outer darkness, sorrow, and pain. Matthew 22, 13. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is eternal. 
Matthew 25, 46, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Hell is a place of torment. Luke 16, 24 through 26. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted, and you are tormented. Hell is a place of separation. Luke 16.26 And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. The Bible speaks of the reality of hell in the same terms as the reality of heaven. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, 1 and 2 Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In fact, Jesus spent more time warning people about the dangers of hell than he did in comforting them with the hope of heaven. The concept of a real, conscious, forever and ever existence in hell is just as biblical as a real, conscious, forever and ever existence in heaven. Trying to separate them is simply not possible from a biblical standpoint. This is the one life we have, so we should celebrate it with one another, you know, for all the time that we get. Good job. I mean, I get it and I don't get it. It's almost like decaf coffee to me, right? Like, you're taking the God out of all of the religious practices, the singing, the gathering, uh, the offerings. Um, it it like seems vegan, like you're going nine tenths like, of the like way. Vegan meat no, replacement. The, the last tenth <laughs> yeah. is a big tenth, you know. And if you want the community, I understand this. You want the community these days with all the distractions and how busy everyone is. We're losing that. Um, but maybe you have. You're not sure how you feel about about faith. That's a good so point, Adrian. I think yeah. every human craves community. Yeah. And we find it in any way we can. Yeah, it's true. You yeah. run a uh, church without God on Sunday, don't you? It's called the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is nothing more essential to the world than the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul declares what the gospel is and how important it is to embrace it and share it with others. He reminds the Corinthians of the gospel he preached among them, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That Christ is coming back for his church someday in the rapture according to the scriptures. As we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Jesus promised his followers he was going to go and prepare a place for them in his Father's house, where there are many mansions as we read in John 14, 1-3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is the essence of the gospel, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross for sinners, his resurrection to everlasting life, and his coming back someday is central to our Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, 
pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Hurricane Helene, more than a week now since the storm cut a path of destruction from Florida to Tennessee. It's become the deadliest storm to hit the mainland U.S. since Katrina in 2005. Really just stunning numbers. Helene's toll in lives this morning, at least 220. And an untold number of people are still missing. While rescues of stranded and desperate survivors are still underway. Got to tell you, just driving through here, we've seen unbelievable devastation, very much like a war zone. And we are here in the Asheville area here because it is facing one of the longest roads to recovery. But the deaths and damage, they are widespread across half a dozen states. The situation is still very much an emergency this morning, as you can imagine. You were just talking about all of the relief coming into Western North Carolina. Of course, the military is a huge part of that. We know active duty troops, along with thousands of guardsmen from all over the southeast, are in the disaster zone. And this morning, with that death toll climbing, you know, dozens still unaccounted for. For the loss of power, no water. I mean, the situation over in Western North Carolina is still so dire. This morning, the painstaking recovery and desperate search entering its second week. Helene's death toll still climbing. At least 220 people killed, but the number of those unaccounted for improving as crews fan out in hard to reach areas. Buncombe County officials now say 75 remain unaccounted for, down from 200 and promising to keep looking. We know these are hard times. But please know we're coming. We're coming to get you. We're coming to pick up our people that's out there. But many areas remaining inaccessible. This drone video showing a Department of Transportation crew trying to carve a path into the town of Chimney Rock. Here's what the area looked like before this vibrant amusement park. And now, signs it never existed. In the town of Swannanoa, this neighborhood nearly gutted one week ago. The flood water lifting trailers, flooding homes. Now, debris, furniture, personal belongings lining the streets. We were just kind of holding behind that chimney there. John Zara now trying to salvage what he can after he says the rising flood water forced him and his family onto the roof where they waited hours before being rescued. He says neither he nor any of his neighbors have flood insurance. This is just not the kind of thing we see in Asheville, you know. Um, so uh, we've already been denied that coverage and we're working with FEMA to uh, you know, see whatever they're going to be able to do. As the cleanup continues, a growing need for relief. Thousands still without power and water across the storm zone. Relief coming in from all points, food, water and generators. We are just so grateful for everything. Everything that, that everyone has sent. Active duty troops now on the ground to assist in those relief operations. And in Asheville, authorities setting up 40 tankers outside of Mission Hospital, restoring much needed running water. Here is a vile, vile lefty celebrating a deadly, devastating hurricane hitting Republican states. These people are evil. So when I seen the hurricane hit North Carolina and Tennessee, the first thing I thought was, damn, there goes some racists. There, there we go, we got some gone. And then I just seen this video that like the area it hit is like sun downtown out there, sun downtown out there, sun downtown, and they are just completely flattened and gone. And I was like, God's work, God's work. I have no words for that, really. Can you feel it? Can you sense it? Something is changing in our world. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. To the growing tensions in the Middle East. Overnight, explosions lighting up the sky as Israel again struck southern Beirut. Israel hitting Lebanon's capital daily as its war with Hezbollah intensifies. 
Lebanon's health ministry saying more than 2,000 people have now been killed and nearly 10,000 injured, most in just the past two weeks. Israel telling more areas in southern Lebanon to evacuate. 1.2 million people already displaced. Fears of a wider Middle East war still grow. The U.S. Friday struck Yemen, targeting Iran-backed Houthi rebels. The Pentagon saying the strikes were to prevent Houthis targeting shipping. The world bracing for Israel's promised response to Iran's unprecedented missile attack earlier this week. Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Khomeini leading Friday prayers, defiant, telling thousands the strikes were legal and legitimate. Questions now whether Israel will target Iran's oil industry. President Biden Friday, though, seeming to discourage that. I think there are, if, if I were in their shoes, I'd be thinking about other alternatives than striking oil fields. Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, Danny Danone, he says Israel's response to these attacks will be, quote, painful. What happened last night in Israel was not a defensive action over Iran. It was a calculated attack on a civilian population. Israel will not stand by in the face of such aggression. Israel will respond. Our response will be decisive. And yes, it will be painful. Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg joins me now. General, how far will Israel go? I really want to ask, do you think they will attack Iran's nuclear facilities? I think it's clearly on the target list. I think the Supreme Leader, Hamenei, is on the target list as well. And I think when they say it's going to be painful, it'll be painful. And I think what they're trying to do is bring this to some type of resolution. You know, I'm, I'm always amazed, Stuart, when people listen, but they don't really hear. Listen and, and hear what the Israelis are saying. Listen to what Benjamin Netanyahu, who's a, now become a leader of consequence in the Middle East, said when he was at the UN General Assembly. You know, he talked about Moses, and he closed his talk when he talked about the Book of Solomon. You know, they look at this fight in biblical terms, and it's a fight to the finish on good versus evil. What the world doesn't understand is that this is a spiritual war fought in the physical realm. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan hates the Jews with a passion. He hates them because God provided both the Bible and the Messiah through them. He hates them because God called them to be his chosen people. He hates them because God has promised to save a remnant of them. He hates them because God loves them. Satan works overtime to plant seeds of hatred in people's hearts toward the Jews. He is determined to destroy every Jew on planet Earth so that God cannot keep his promise to save a great remnant. He tried to annihilate them in the Holocaust. He failed. He will try to destroy them once again during the last half of the tribulation. He will fail again. America has considerable military force in the region, and that force was used to shoot down some of the rockets which he ran uh, through at Israel. Now, when Israel retaliates and goes after Iran, will we participate in that attack? Will we help? No, well, we're not going to help kinetically. We're going to hold their coats. We're not doing a very good job of that. We probably should be full square behind them, and we're not. But we can provide them diplomatic support. We can provide them supply chain support. In other words, replenish the bomb loads they've got or the things they, mm. they expend in the fight. But the biggest thing we can do is give them diplomatic support. We shouldn't create this equilibrium that there's good on both sides. No, we should be full square behind Israel. We need to tell the world that. You know, Stuart, we haven't done that. When you kind of look at all the things that we've said repeatedly, it hasn't been full up behind Israel. And we, we had, had an opportunity to take at least one target off the table, and that's with the Houthis down in Yemen when they fired at all that shipping in the Red Sea and the approaches to the Red Sea. We didn't do anything. We could have helped the, the Israelis by taking that load off them, but we didn't do it. So sometimes we talk a game. We don't really play a good game. But when it comes to this one, I don't think we're going to support them kinetically, meaning fly airplanes with them. But I think we can give them a lot of other support. We need to do that. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, 
I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's foreign policy is pretty simple. If you bless Israel, you will be blessed. If you curse Israel, you will be cursed. Biden and Harris have undermined Israel every step of the way. They talk out of both sides of their mouths, saying Israel has a right to defend themselves, while at the same time telling Israel to de-escalate. This is no way for an ally to act. The United States should be standing alongside Israel instead of appeasing their enemies. Israel's enemies are an existential threat, and by the way, the enemies of Israel are also the enemies of the U.S. If Israel's enemies would just put down their weapons of war, there would be peace. The sad thing is, if Israel puts down their weapons, there will be no more Israel. Israel is the apple of God's eye, and the world, including America, will be judged for its actions regarding Israel. Zechariah 2.8 For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. And they're fighting in multiple directions against multiple enemies, and they're doing quite well. And I think what you're looking now is they finally said, okay, we've taken Hamas off the table, we've neutralized Hezbollah, we've for the most part neutralized the Houthis as well, and now we're going to go after the big target, which happens to be Iran, and their primary big target, the, their crown jewel, Stuart, is their, are their nuclear yeah. development facilities, yeah. and that's Esfahan, Natanz, Fordo, and they've shown they've got the ability to get there because they've flown quite large distances. They've shown they've got bunker, bunker buster bombs. They proved that against Nasrallah, and I think they can get there, and I think what's going to be is painful. Look, something happened just the other day, which to me is a tell, kind of this is what's going to happen. They took out four Syrian air defense sites with what they call SEED, S-E-A-D, Suppression of Enemy Air Defense. Why did they do that? They're creating a lane, an air lane that goes right to Iran. I said, Barry, start picking up those tells because you get indicators of what's going to happen. And I think what you're looking at, they're going to do it on their time schedule, when they want to do it, and they've got an enormous target list they can go after, but they're not doing do anything with a pinprick. They're going after the big targets. As we continue to watch the Muslim world unite against Israel, the Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9. In that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. Jeremiah 49, 34 through 37. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is Bashar nuclear reactor located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Bashar nuclear reactor. There's a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end-time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. 
In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them, as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin the infamous Gog of Magog? that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator 
who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei led Friday prayers in Tehran today for the first time in more than four years. He said Iran is ready to strike Israel again if necessary. To drive home the point, the 85-year-old cleric clutched an assault rifle. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is at war with Iran's network of allies. The main battleground is Lebanon against Hezbollah, which has been attacking northern Israel with rockets for nearly a year in response, the group says, to Israel's war on Gaza. Beirut is now rocked by Israel day and night. Here, Israel targeted what an official said was a meeting of Hezbollah leaders. In southern Lebanon, Israel is trying to carve out a buffer zone free of Hezbollah. Israeli strikes are taking their toll here. The city of Tyre, one of the biggest cities here in southern Lebanon, has effectively been evacuated. There are very few civilians left here. Hezbollah has taken a beating in recent days, but the group remains intact. And every day down here, we have seen and heard outgoing fire. Lebanese officials say 1,400 people have been killed. In Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu and his war cabinet are still deciding how and when to respond to Iran's missile attack. That decision will be felt across the Middle East and beyond. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what? Appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready!
time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.